Good afternoon. We are here at the University of Maine Blueberry Hill Research Station. And this is Dr. Allison Dibble, who has plots and does work on blueberry pollination. Well, Allison, what are we doing out here in the rain in Maine in May? This is an experiment that looks at the behavior of bees, especially native wild bees, of which Maine has about 265 species. And we're interested in what the bees will do when they're offered flowers of different species of plants. The idea is that in this experiment, we have 28 patches each with a different flowering plant. And over the course of five years, we're able to look at quite a number of different plants. We switch out some, others stay for the duration of the study. What are we looking at right in front of us? This is a shad bush. It's called Amelanchier ulnifolia, and it's a cultivar regent. It doesn't get very tall, and it's a great favorite of bees on a warm, sunny day. It's also related to many native amelanchier or shadbush species which are in our area. So this is a candidate that a blueberry grower might wish to consider if that person would like to have plantings around the farm that are alternate forage for the same pollinators that also visit lowbush blueberry. And we then are able to see which bees are coming. We can actually identify them to groups by eye and we're not capturing them at this stage of the study. So you can get an idea of what, what food sources they prefer. That is the intent. Now what a farmer might choose to do is then take our lists of what the bees really liked and uh, decide which of those plants the farmer would like to have on his or her own property and they may wish to create a garden that would have some of these and it might be in some of the out of the way parts of the farm, perhaps near the house or near the barn, near where the equipment gets stored, someplace a little bit out of the way. Overall, we hope that this would lead to a buildup of the populations of the native wild bees. We have woody plants. We also have some annuals and we like to compare some fancy cultivars to their, shall we say, their more simple and plain um, uh, native species that they might be related to. So we're interested in whether the cultivars are losing some of their pollinator resources when they're bred to have more color or something else that people value but that insects may not find as compelling. This is a hole that was one meter by one meter that we added sand, peat, and a little bit of clay to the backfill, put it back in and mounded it up. We put sticks on it to try to prevent severe erosion if there's a heavy rain. And what we're hoping is that the ground nesting bees will arrive here and create their holes and perhaps make a nest in the prepared spot. I see, so the, the sand, so you want well-drained soil then for well -drained them to nest in. And sunny. And sunny. We're interested in demonstrating the types of resources that bees require for nesting. And some of the things that we do are put up nest blocks that leaf cutter bees might use. We also have attempted a ground nesting habitat in a small patch with the idea of build it and they will come. And we have on this farm a berm that is just over here. It was created, oh, about, um, I'm gonna guess about eight years ago that is well-drained soil that's been mounded up and the idea is that ground nesting bees might move into that habitat. So you can see that he did this on purpose. He had the uh, backhoe create a ditch and then put the backfill up to create a sunny, sloping, well-drained patch of bare ground. This is the south. So we've got full sun on this. The size of it is not as important as the fact that it's well-drained. 
Ideally, the soil might have just a little bit of clay in it so that a bee tunnel wouldn't have its sides collapse. This could be one here. And I'm going to suggest that this should be considered. Now the fact that it's just been raining makes it a little harder to interpret this. This is another. Because if it were drier conditions, we could expect a little pile of loose, fine sand around the hole right at the entrance. And that's the excavation uh, material that the bee has brought out from many repeated trips. And the hole may extend quite some distance into the loose soil. It could go down 18 inches or sometimes much more than that. Some of these have been excavated to uh, more than four feet deep. Not every native wild bee would go into this nest. But the intent is that a leafcutter bee might find this very interesting, would explore and go in and lay an egg, seal off, lay another egg, seal off. Each time the egg gets laid, the bee is provisioning it with pollen and nectar that it's bringing from the flowers nearby. You can see that some of these appear to be occupied. This one seems to be especially likely. So this would have been a bee that was here last summer and it may come out soon and start its work for this year. So, and, so basically you, one you, after drill, another. you drill holes in these blocks and you're That's providing correct. a nesting site for them. Correct. A uh, backyard gardener can do this and farmers can do it or you can hire someone to do a bunch of them for you. And then they get hung at about four, maybe five feet above the ground in a sunny location and uh, sometimes blue jays or woodpeckers will try to get into them, but for the most part, they tend to be uh, maintenance, low maintenance. Yeah, well, it seems like a very economical way to get some more pollinators. Yes, now the Xerxes Society recommends that they be at least 50 feet apart, and you'll see that they are along this fence uh, at intervals. They also recommend that you change them out regularly. They can be up for a few years, but gradually you would switch them over because that way you tend to reduce the buildup of disease. Eric, hey. what are you up to out here in the in this cool day, cool rainy <laughs> damp day in Maine? Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually sampling uh, native bee visitation to blueberry flowers. Um, so you can see these wooden stakes that are situated throughout this field here. And this one is one of the closer points to a wildflower planting. And so what we're trying to do is determine if this planting affects the native bee visitation rates to the blueberry flowers. And these wildflowers are, aren't, certainly aren't blooming this time of year, but it looks like <clears throat> you have a number of different kinds of plants over here. Yeah, well this is a perennial, uh, mostly perennial wildflower mix, which we planted last year. Um, in the kind of early to mid-summer. And so last August, this was full of flowers, mostly Coreopsis and some Gayardia and some, and some sunflower. So of course, over the winter, the flowers have died and hopefully dropped some seed. But there's also what we see now in all of these green kind of clumps are actually perennial wildflowers that will hope, hopefully will be flowering um, after blueberry bloom. We formulated this mix so that they wouldn't co-flower with blueberry because if they do, uh, then it might draw pollinators away from the blueberry crops. You don't want that kind of competition. No, do we don't want competition. What we want to do is enhance the native pollinator population. We don't want to compete with a crop. We want to, we want to help the crop. So you're, you're <clears throat> providing food year, year, year round really for the bees to be able to, to help them. Yeah, that's the idea because um, you can see how big this blueberry field is and when it's blooming right now, there's lots of flowers out here for the bees and on a nice day you'll see the bees are all over, honeybees and native bees uh, alike. But when the crop is done flowering, there's really not many resources left. And so we're trying to fill in uh, that gap in bloom, fill in that gap in, in the availability of bee food by providing 
other flowers later in the season. And so that's what we're hoping this will do.